singing over me You've been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life for me You've been so, so
a shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. place your love won't chase us, Father. Father, you just reach to the ends of the earth and just find us. You bring us into your arms and you love us unconditionally. Let us realize that love, Father. Let's walk in that love. Surrender to that love. So, so good.
talking about essentials, and I want to kind of wrap that up today, and I want to go into a different, uh, little different way starting next week. But I was reading this article about an 85-year-old woman. By the way, if you didn't get a bulletin, you can get one in the back. Just get up, walk over there and grab one, or yell at one of the ushers. Don't yell at them. Raise your hand or something. Or you can go to my church app and go to Christ Chapel, and you'll find us there, and you'll find it already filled out for you. If you're new here this morning, I just want to say welcome. Uh, we, if, if you'd fill out that little welcome part and hand in over there, we'd love to give you something and just tell you that we're glad you're here with us this morning in the house of God. I was reading an article about a woman who was 85 years old. She's teaching Sunday school to ninth grade girls, which I thought was interesting. Her name is Fanny, and she has been a believer for 70 years. That's quite a mark, isn't it? For 70 years. And the guy who wrote this article said it was so much fun just to talk to her because she was just so upbeat. She sensed the presence of God. Um, she was vibrant. She was fun. And he asked her, he says, Fanny, over 70 years, uh, how have you maintained your spiritual vitality? How have you come to the point where you've made it? What's been your secret? And she says, my secret is I just keep growing. My secret, she goes, is I've never stopped walking with him. And every day I fall more in love with him than I did yesterday. What a nice statement to say, 70 years. And then she says, he grabbed my arm, or she grabbed my arm, and she says, walking with Jesus isn't easy. Sometimes it's taking three steps forward and two steps back. How many of you know what that's like? Three steps forward and two steps back. But then she finished it off by saying this, it may not be easy, but it's always good. And I want you to understand this morning that God desires that we walk with him. He desires that we grow with him. So we're going to be talking about three steps forward and two steps back today. And um, it made me think about how do we walk in our lives? How do we grow through life? And that's my message this morning. How do you grow spiritually? Um, How do you come to that point where you understand the essentials for life so that growth takes place in your life? And I kind of want to wrap up the essentials because I want to start next Sunday about rethinking your life. In fact, I, I've already been working on the message, and I think my title is going to be Why You Need to Think About What You Think About. And uh, so think about that this week, and come next week to hear about it, and uh, rethinking your life. But the essential for this year, in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, there are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. So I kind of want to tie a little ribbon around the essentials today because I want to move into something else. And, um, and I want you to understand this. First of all, faith is our foundation. There's faith, hope, and love. Faith is our foundation. And it, this is the essence or the backbone of Christianity. It's what we stand on. Faith is what unites us to God. It's, uh, it's what allows us to have a relationship. So faith, right down, is our foundation. But hope, hope is our attitude. How many of y'all need an attitude of hope? And uh, we sang a little bit about that today. We have a hope, a presence that God is in control. And as we hope in eternity uh, that we'll be with him, that should be our attitude. If I have the attitude of hope, I can make it through an awful lot of things. The hope that tomorrow's got to be better than today. The hope that God is going to, when all is said and done and my life is over with, he's prepared a place for me. I have that hope. But that then leads us to love. And love is our action. 
So faith is our foundation, hope is our attitude, and love is our action. And when faith and hope line up, what takes place in our life is we're free to love because we understand God's love for us and how extensive that is. We don't have to hear a message every Sunday on God's love to know how strong God's love is for us. And what does the Bible say? The Bible says that people will know that you're my followers by your love for one another. That means that we have to put up with each other. Hello? And we got to love doing it. And uh, isn't that pleasant? But that's a part of our life. Love is the action that takes place right here. So it's a pretty neat, tiny little package. And we could just end right there and go home and go eat some breakfast. But I got more I want to share this morning. Because here's what happens. We have faith, hope, and love, but I've discovered that at times those things fizzle out if I don't keep growing. Something begins to happen in our life. So why a message on spiritual growth? Well, because we're human. And at times we're going to drift. At times we're going to fade. At times we're going to wander. At times we're going to get lazy. At times we're going to give up. Can anybody relate to those? Yes, that you had those lives when you wandered, you drifted, you faded, you just got lazy. And, I mean, I have sat where you sat. I've been there, I've been listening to a message, it takes place in my life, and I make a commitment to that. In fact, I was thinking last year, I was listening to someone speak, and he was talking about peace, and I thought, you know what, I need more peace in my life. And the more he talked about it, I thought, you know, he really hit me. It was like he was a fly on the wall in my office that past week, and I needed more peace in my life, so I thought, Lord, I'm going to have more peace. And then I went home, and I walked through my garage, and I went down to my little workroom that I needed to clean up. I thought, i got to clean up this workroom, and i got to clean up this garage. And I walked in the house, and the phone began to ring, and after the phone rang and I answered it, I had to answer a few emails, then I had to answer a few texts, and then Paula goes, uh, would you put up the Christmas decorations from three years ago? They're still out. you got to take care of that, you know, and those things that I absolutely love. And then I had to take care of some bills, and by the time I was done, I had no peace whatsoever. I had made the statement that I was going to have more peace, and in just hours earlier after making that commitment, it had already fallen apart. Here's the good news. The good news is that the Bible is filled with people that wander, drift, and fade. I'm not the only one. If you read the Word of God, you'll find that in the Old Testament, the Israelites said, God, if you're real, give us a sign. So God gave them a sign, and they said, oh, you are real. Three days later, they turn their back on God and they start worshiping some golden calf or some golden armadillo or something. And, and God's back on the shelf where he, where he shouldn't be. He should have been right there in the center. Three days after seeing that God is real, they wandered off. I look, in the, I look further in, I see the prophets in the Old Testament. The prophets in the Old Testament would preach about God's love and God's warning and all those things. And then you know what they'd do? A lot of times you'd find out they'd go and pout someplace. They knew God would talk directly to them. Then they would go and pout over who knows what. I'm the only one left. Everybody else is gone. You know, And, and you, you know the stories if you've read the Old Testament. Then if you go to the New Testament, the New Testament, many of the books are written to the churches where believers have wandered. Basically, the message of the new church is don't give up. Keep going. You can make it. You have fallen, but, but get back up. Remember what you've been taught. That basically is the story. God is intimately aware of our shortcomings in life. He understands those. He's aware of our tendencies. So, if you look at your notes, that first scripture there is Hebrews 10, 36. Here's the writer of Hebrews trying to convey this message to the believers. He says, patient endurance is what you need now. So you will continue to do God's will. Then you will receive all that he has promised. You might want to underline, so you will continue to do God's will. In other words, you need patient endurance so you'll keep growing. At the end of chapter 10, we move into chapter 11. I don't know why I say that, because you don't move into chapter 12. You move into chapter 11 after chapter 10. How many of y'all have left with something profound now? <laughs> 11 follows 10. And, um, and chapter 11 is filled with examples and models of faith. If you've read chapter 11, it's a, it's a fantastic chapter. Both men and women who did not have perfect backgrounds. And if you look at their lives, they had made it into the hall of faith because of of their dependency upon God. That's all of chapter 11. Guess what? After chapter 11 comes chapter 12. That's right. Woo, that's right. That's amazing. So now you got 10, 11, and 12. And those first two verses of chapter 12 is what I kind of want to focus on. 
Because he gives us a plan here on how to be a person of faith, how to continue to grow. And, um, and I'm calling it the endurance plan. But after I wrote the endurance plan, I, I, I'd like you to scratch that out and put down the continual growth plan. Because I think that's what appeals to me more now after I wrote this. The continual growth plan. It's just a nicer term. A continual growth plan that we ought to look at, that we ought to keep in front of us. It's taken around all these two verses. Let me read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. We have around us so many people whose lives tell us what faith means. So let us run the race that is before us and never give up. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from start to finish. I want to give you four action steps that I think are right out of these two verses that I believe that you could find them yourselves, but it gives me something to share with you this morning. So I'll give you the, the liberty just to relax and jot them down, okay? But there are four action steps if you want to continue to grow in your spiritual walk as we've now walked into 2021. The first thing is this, is number one, find an example, Find an example. It says there is that we have around us so many people whose lives tell us what faith means. Obviously, he's referring to the people in chapter 11. They, they are, are the example that, that you can see and that we can read about. And we need to study and we need to learn from those people of faith, use them as a model. But in addition, studying those examples, I believe that it's, it's wise for us to find an example in our own lives that we can see. Somebody that we can look at, an example that we can watch, an example that, that we can touch because we learn from models. And in your notes, I put faith, hope, and love, and my challenge to you is that you would find somebody to model each one of those. So I left a line there for each one that maybe you could write down somebody's name, somebody who is a model of faith, somebody who is a model of hope, somebody who is a model of love that you can see and that you can touch so that when you're going through times when you doubt your faith, you doubt your hope, you doubt your love, you can say, oh, I can turn to so-and-so and they can help me in this area. Who is in your life right now that is a model of somebody you can learn from? And some of you who have been uh, believers for a while, your first thought is going to be, well, shouldn't we just model, use our model Jesus? Yes, and I'll get to that in a few moments. But at times, it's helpful to have a model that we can see, a model that we can touch. And I want to encourage you to find someone in your life, find somebody uh, perhaps in this church that you can say, hey, you know what? I, I, I want to run, somebody who's touchable, somebody that you can reach out. And you might say, well, pastor, I know the perfect person here. I'm just going to use Lil Harrop. <laughs> I mean, who's a better example, I believe, here in this church than Pastor Lil Harrop? Of faith, hope, and love. I, can, I have never yet sat down with that, into, with that man where he hasn't shared gold nuggets of wisdom to me. That's his ability. But I'm going to tell you this this morning. That is not all of us have the opportunity to rub shoulders with him every single day. Not all of us have that opportunity. So find someone that will express their faith. So I find somebody, because I don't want everybody going to Pastor Lil Harrop after church and saying, I want you to be my model. I'm going to follow you all week. He's going to be mad at me, and I don't want him mad at me. And, uh, but I can tell you from having been around him that he expresses his faith, his hope, and his love the way that I believe God exemplifies that. So find someone who's touchable that, that can help you grow in your life. I was thinking back when I was in college, um, my, my pastor was my model. And my pastor was an example of faith, of hope, of love. He was a great man. And when H.C. Noah spoke, I would listen to his sermons and his messages. I would literally be on the edge of my seat. And I got to the point where I believed the man was perfect. There was nothing he could do wrong. I... I my pastor was right up there next to Jesus. And, um, and then one day, in fact, it got to the point where I had a hard time sometimes doing Christianity because I thought I'll never be that individual. I can't be like him. He just, it got me kind of frustrated. He's just way, way, way up there. And then one year I got invited over to his house. He said, hey, Rick, come on over. He was like a grandfather to me. And uh, he says, come on over to the house and let's have dinner and hang out and uh, Sister Noah will make, so I always called him Brother Noah, and here's, I all of a sudden saw Brother Noah in a different light. It was the first time I saw him where he wasn't wearing a suit. He had on, I think some, I don't think they were jeans, but they weren't dress slacks, and, um, and he had a shirt, looked like it had a stain on it, I thought, oh, that's not perfect, and uh, he enjoyed watching the Cowboys, 
Well, I do too. And uh, if we got something in common right here, he got frustrated and mad when they called a play that wasn't right or the refs. They, I mean, he talked to the ref, refs, and I thought, oh, he's just like me. He's imperfect. And uh, he enjoyed sitting down. He enjoyed laughing. He had this hearty chuckle that whenever he laughed, you couldn't help but put a smile on your face. He enjoyed life. He always had a smile that really nobody could resist. And it made me see him in a whole different light besides always behind or on a platform or behind a pulpit. It let me see him as simply who he was. And he became instrumental in my life because those first couple of years of college, he was more touchable to me. In fact, the first time I ever had to have, my first time when I became a pastor, I was 23 and I had my first funeral. My funeral was a, a man who believed he was a wizard in the occult, and he went across the street to claim a girl as his wife. And when he got to the door, the father met him and shot him and killed him. That was my first funeral. And I, the, his daughter, his daughter, his sister had just come to our church, her heart sold out for Jesus. And she goes, would you do my brother's funeral? I said, well, who is he? She goes, well, he's on the front page of the Dallas Times Herald. I said, that guy? She goes, yeah. So I called Brother Noah. I said, Brother Noah, what do I do? I was freaking out. And he says, uh, well, it, was he saved? I said, I don't think so. He's on the front page of your, of your newspaper. And he gave me the most solid advice. And uh, he says, Rick, preach a message of salvation. Win that family to Jesus. You can't do anything for him right now, but you can do a whole lot for the family. And that was my first funeral where an entire family gathered around a casket and they all gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. God can do amazing things. But he was a man that I had to turn to often. I didn't know what to say. And finally, as the years rolled by and he got older and older and he was no longer a pastor, one day I walked into a grocery store on my side of town in Garland. And who's sitting in the cafeteria area but Brother Noah? And I said, Brother Noah, what are you doing over here? You live in Oak Cliff, you know, on the other side of town. He goes, I, Rick, I don't know how to get home. And he got to the point where things had set in where he couldn't remember things. And I called his kids and then, and um, I says, I'm going to bring Brother Noah home. Just want you to know his car is going to be over here. And I'll drive him back to the house. And, and I had the opportunity to help him during some tough days. But I'll tell you what, you've got to find somebody who you can touch. Sometimes somebody who you can see and say, okay, here's my model of faith. Here's my model of hope. And here's my model of love. Yes, I know Jesus is my model, but I need something a little bit more. I need something I can touch today. Amen? We need that in our life. The apostle knew this. Apostle Paul, here's what he says in Philippians 3.17. Follow me as I follow Christ. He says, let me be your example. Follow me. So I want to challenge you that in your life, be somebody that somebody else can follow. Grow to the point in your life where you don't feel bad having people follow you because you can be that person. What's number two? Number two is this. Remove your hurdles. Remove your hurdles. Hebrews 12, the latter part of verse 1 says this. We should remove from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. So in order for you and I to remove hurdles, what do we need to do? What we need to do is we need to know what they are. We need to identify them, and we need to find out whatever they might be to relinquish our will or our courage to change. And the, the, we need to spend the time finding out what are the hurdles in our life. And I'm going to give you two things that are hurdles in your life. The first thing, two types of obstacles. The first thing it says there is, I would call anything. You might say, well, that's really vague. That's what Scripture says. We should remove from our lives anything. So, that can be good. That can be bad. But it's anything that gets in the way of getting us closer to Jesus. You see, so often we think the things that keep us away from the Lord are bad things. But I'll tell you right now, what keeps most Christians from growing in their Christian walk is actually good things. It's just not the right thing. God has to be number one. And if you have anything else above that, it's an obstacle. It's a hurdle that you have to get, you, get over in your lives. It could be work. It could be friends. It could be money. But the Bible doesn't say money is bad. It says the love of money is bad. And, uh, I mean, it could be relationships. It could be food. It could be anything. But in my life, my obstacle, I find from my own life at times, as I'm going to be honest with you this morning, sometimes the obstacle in my life is my job. 
And uh, you might say, well, pastor, how can that be a, a problem? I mean, you know, in fact, one guy, one kid years ago says, uh, pastor, what do you do all day? I said, I pray all day. If you'd quit sinning, I could get something done. <laughs> and he looked, you should have seen the look in that boy's face. Like, oh, man, is he going to tell me what my sins are? I probably could have. And uh, I said, if you would quit sinning, I could actually get some work done. But I got to spend all day praying for you. And, uh, and I, you know. But here's the deal. Sometimes my job is what gets in the way. Sometimes I'm in a hurry to get to work. I'm in a hurry to get all these things done. And by the end of the day, I've not spent any time with him. Because I've been busy doing other things. And God's got to remind me, hey, Rick, you know, you, you kind of blew it today because you have yet to even talk to me. You've talked to everybody else, and you've left me out. It's easy to have good things get in the way of your life. So what's yours? What's your anything that, uh, that maybe you can write down and say, this is, what, this is the area that kind of bothers me in my life? The second obstacle is you can write this down. It's a little easier. It's sin. It says here in that scripture that we just read, uh, we should remove our, from our lives anything that would get in the way and the sin that so easily holds us back. And uh, so I say this this morning because every time we hear that word, we only think of the biggies. We, th we think of murder. We think of adultery. We think of stealing. And we kind of gloss over the little ones, like little white lies, uh, uh, cheating, slander, gossip. Well, you know, I, I have a right to share this because people need to know. Well, no, they don't. That's not your job. God says those things are just as sinful as some of the big things. What is sin? Sin basically is just missing the mark. You've missed what God intended for your life. So in this plan for growth, my challenge to us is that we take some time to identify what are your hurdles in life, uh, what's slowing you down, what's keeping you from growing the way that God wants you to grow. And then when you identify it, you need to admit it, you need to confess it to God, receive his forgiveness, move on and experience the freedom. Don't get stuck in that one spot where you don't move on. Move on and experience the freedom because God has forgiven us of all sin. Amen. If it's been put on the cross, if it's been put behind us, then put it behind you and move on with what God has in your life. It sounds real easy, but I think it's more difficult than we understand sometimes. And I want you to also understand that anybody who stands on this stage, whoever it might be, is not above sin. Hello? We say, Pastor, we know that. We know you. Well, thank you very much. That's not exactly what I meant, but here's the deal. We all fall short of the glory of God. All of us sin. If you ever meet a pastor who says, well, you know what, I'm just, I don't make those kind of mistakes. Well, I'll tell you what he's going to because that's one sin right there called pride. We have to come to what we understand. And I often have, have, have had to practice what I preach. I've had to identify that area of my life. I've had to confess it before God. I've had to receive God's forgiveness. I've had to ask for accountability. And I've had to move on and experience the freedom that God has. Because all of us have the potential of sinning. So we put our trust in God. But your homework today is write down what is that anything under obstacle one. Under obstacle two, the sins... Don't write them down right now because the person next to you might want to peek to, at your paper to see what they are. That's one problem. The other problem is I probably didn't give you enough paper. So, and, uh, so you can work on that when you get home. But I've talked to enough people in church through meetings and counseling that I can sense in people's lives when they've got sin or a hurdle. And, um, and like the Bible says, it's entangling them and... They're caught in those ways. They're, they're not living the freedom that God wants. They're not experiencing the intimacy. And I'm telling you this morning, get rid of that stuff and let God do something in your life. So what's the third thing? The third thing is this. Focus on Jesus. I told you we would get to him. Focus on Jesus. Jesus is the answer to everything. And... Um, and I often think about the Sunday school teacher who said, what is it that hops around, is furry, has big, long ears? Tommy, can you tell me? He goes, well, I think it's a rabbit, but Jesus is the answer to everything, so I'm going to say Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, 
Well, here's the main point. So I'll tell you this. Put a star next to his name, an asterisk, circle it. This could be a one-point message, but this is the key for spiritual growth. I wish there was an easy way to say it, but there's not. When I think of spiritual growth, I, I like the image of a fire. And, um, and you've heard this before. Somebody's on fire for Jesus. He's on fire. She's on fire. And, uh, and I, what I'd like to know is what makes them on fire? And uh, what is it that, that makes them that way? What is the secret? I'll tell you one thing is we get, it's the Holy Spirit. He said, well, that's, we put you on fire. But there's a little bit more to it, I think, than, than just that. People who are on fire, if I could put it, thinking of a fire, people who keep a fire going put logs on the fire. So I want to give you a few logs this morning that I think are imperative. And these logs, you might call them disciplines and uh, some basic spiritual disciplines. We don't like the word discipline sometimes because it kind of hurts. And, uh, and that's part of the Bible where it says, discipline yourselves for the purpose of godliness. Some of us think, well, I just don't like that. So I'm going to give you another word. You can call them habits. Habits that you need in your life to make you be the person that God wants you to be. And the bottom line is, is it's tough. Because a lot of us, what we want is we want an instant fire. You know, we want, a, uh, we want a little switch, a gas fire, that there's no work involved. We just turn it on like my fireplace at home, and pff, there it is. Paula wanted a fireplace, and I said, okay, we got one. And she goes, but, you know, I said, I'm not bringing wood in. Just throwing that out there right now. I'm not going to be the guy who's chopping up wood in the backyard, you know, and that's just not me. You put an axe in my hand, I'll cut something off, and it probably won't be a log. So, you know, I, uh, I'm not going there, and uh, I like the instant fire. Our first year in Heidelberg, when I was pastoring there with the military, we did a bonfire. And I told them I would take care of it, so I went out to the golf course, and I knew they had pallets there, and I got 12 pallets. And I was going to, I just thought, pile them 12 high, which is what I did. And then I got about five gallons of gasoline, I doused that sucker, and I'm just, pfft. I'm putting gas all over it. Then I went and found some matches. And I lit a match about 15 feet from the fire, and it lit up. We had instant fire, and, uh, which the German police don't like, I found out. And uh, we're at the rotting gun club of the military. We got a fire about 30 feet high, going like crazy. Nobody could roast marshmallows or hot dogs. You know, we're 50 feet away, you know, trying to get this thing done. The sirens are blaring, the police come, the fire department comes, everybody comes. I get reprimanded in German, so I don't know what they said. And, uh, it's, I saw, and they're going to town on me. And, uh, and they doused it all down. They said, well, I got this, three. <laughs> three pallets, no more at a time. But I wanted an instant fire. Sometimes in our Christian walk, that's what we want. We want instant fire. But I'm telling you this morning, you've got to put some, there's some basic logs you've got to put on your fire, and here they are. The first one, I, even, I wrote them out so you didn't have to fill it in. The first one is you need the Bible. You need this book. You need time in God's Word. God's Word, this Bible is not an irrelevant history book. This book is God's love letter to us. I like it when I see new believers get caught up and excited about reading God's Word, and they just say, I can't get enough of it. I had to read this some more, and I love your enthusiasm. But I want to talk about those of you who maybe are a little bit longer along in the faith, in your Christian walk, and you've lost that desire to read. You think, oh, another year, I guess I, I could try and read through the Bible, but you've lost that desire that you once had to devour the Word of God. If that describes you, I want you to develop that hunger. Put more logs on the fire. This is God's love letter to you. You might say, I've read it so many times. Read it again. Here's what I've discovered about God's word. Every time I read it, he gives me something new. It's amazing. You're like, oh, man, I can use that. I can't believe he shared that with me today. Let this word be engrafted into your heart. Make it a part of everything that you do every day. Some say, well, it's not a love letter. It's a rule book. It's not a rule book. But there are guidelines in the Word of God. People always go to the Ten Commandments and say, well, that's what they are, the Ten Commandments. What about those? Well, those are rules. But these are, these are, are rough rules. You know, do not murder. I think that's a good suggestion. That's a guideline that you probably should follow in your life. Do not commit adultery. It's probably more than just a suggestion. 
God, what, listen, God's not down on life. What God is down on is pain in your life. He gives you those for the purpose that your life is not so destructive and you don't have to go through so much pain in your life. It's for your benefit, not for his. He's saying, basically, I love you so much that I want to show you. I want to guide you. I want, to, I want you to see how to live. I want your life to be more than what you possibly thought it could ever be. And after 40 plus years of working with people, um, I've discovered something that is now pervading into the church. And it's what I might call moral relativism. And what that basically is, is that everything is okay for everybody. And we simply have to accept the way everybody is. I hear a lot of people say, well, that's not okay for me, but it's okay for them. The only reason they say that is because they don't know the truth. And this Bible doesn't change. And just because the world is changing its morality and its moral rules doesn't mean that God has. We have to stand on the word of God. This is the truth. It doesn't change. If your mindset is, well, I think that it's irrelevant, I'm telling you right now, it's not. Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the life, and I am the way. That doesn't change. He's the truth, he's the way, and he's the life. He was that way yesterday, he's that way today, and he'll be that way tomorrow. It's always going to be the same. So what's the second thing you need? You need prayer. Spending time talking to him and letting God talk to you. Number one is the Bible, spending time in God's word, but prayer is conversation with God, dialogue. You can't have a relationship without dialogue. Has some of you tried that? Doesn't work very well, does it? How many of y'all have ever, how many of y'all have ever had your spouse give you the silent treatment? Anybody here or am I the only one? You're afraid to raise your hand because you're sitting next to him, aren't you? Yeah, like I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. And uh, no, you have to have dialogue. The third is you have to have accountability. And uh, with, with another believer. And um, time with them where you can talk with them and do some things. And by the way, let me just speak for our entire church staff. We will do anything we can to help you in these three areas. We want to help you come to a point where if you need a Bible, we'll get you one. If you need to know, need to know where to start, we'll help you. If you need to get into a small group, we'll help you find one. If you need to learn how to pray, we'll help you learn how to pray. We'll do anything because we are committed to your growth. We want to help you be the person that God wants you to be. These are the things, the spark to ignite the whole, that fire is the Holy Spirit. You add the Holy Spirit to those three right there, and I'll tell you what, God's going to do something great in your life. So why do I give you this list? To give you some happy hoops to jump through? No. Um, if you do these things, are you going to earn God's favor and he'll applaud? No, because you can't really earn God's favor. And... Uh, uh, this is all done because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. And because of that, we have this ability to do this. So when I'm in a hurry, I find something takes place in my life. I have a hard time focusing on those three things. And God wants me to be a different person, and he wants you to be a different person. This year, I want to challenge you to maybe slow down. Because when I have found that when I'm in a hurry... When I get in, get up late, and I got to get to work, and I jump in my car, and rather than listening to God's word or listening to a Christian, I put on the 70s music, because that's my favorite years to listen to music, um, sorry, focus gets kind of tough. I can remember during Christmas time, I went shopping, shopping, I went shopping, I can finish whole words, I don't have to cut them in half. I was getting on the freeway, I was driving down the road, and I was on my way to, is it Oaks Park? Is that that mall? Is that what it's called? What is it called? Oak Park. I can tell those of you who shop. And, uh, you know, the Christmas time, it's kind of crazy, and the traffic was crazy, and I was trying to get on into a right lane to get into the mall, and rather than waiting for the light to turn green, I thought, you know, I can make it down that little bike section there and uh, with my car, and if I'm just real careful, and uh, so I... Got to the right, and I'm scooting in, and I'm watching real closely on the left because I don't want to hit any cars, and all of a sudden, I pop up, and I'm on the curb, and I thought, oops, I kind of overshot there, but being a pastor, I got thinking about that. I thought, you know, there's got to be some type of spiritual analogy to this in, uh, in my car, and I began thinking the world is on the left side of our lives, and, um, 
and the person of Jesus is on the right side. And sometimes I'm so busy looking on the left side where the world's at that I completely miss out on Jesus on the right side. And in my life, I need to be focused on him. That's what it's all about, focusing on Jesus Christ. Rather than every once in a while giving him a high five or, or you know, give me 10 here at church, make it a daily part of my life where I let Jesus move in and be the focus of everything that I do. That is the key. I focus on Jesus. What's the last thing as we close this morning? The last thing to write down is don't give up. Hebrews 12.2, the challenge and actually the encouragement. It says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, on whom our faith depends. From start to finish, he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy that he knew would be his afterwards. Now he is seated in the place of the highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. The writer of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is our model. He made it. He did it. He endured it, and now he's with God. He lived the life and shows us the example. In 2 Timothy 2.12, it says, If we endure, we shall surely reign with him. That's the challenge. The message is challenging me to put things together this morning that you might live a life that you're focused upon him, you endure the, the life that God has, and you've got a promise down the end. And let me give you two things that I think are encouraging because I want you to leave encouraged this morning. And, um, and I hope that you walk out of here with a game plan for growth and, uh, and some ideas. But I also want to encourage you with two thoughts about spiritual growth. Here's the first one. Spiritual growth is erratic. Spiritual growth is erratic. And um, what do I mean by that? A lot of us, when we talk about being on, on fire for Christ, we feel guilty because we're not living 100% for God. We're kind of missing out a little bit on that. And, uh, and let me let you in on it this morning. No one's living 100% for God. Okay? Um, it's a nice goal. It should be our goal. But no one lives 100% for God all the time. So spiritual growth is erratic. For example, um, if you woke up this morning and you're not a morning person, you're 25% on fire for Christ when you woke up early. Paula right now is about 10%. Ha, huh, honey. <laughs> because we got a new puppy last week. Eight weeks old. And because Sunday's important, she goes, you can sleep in the bedroom and I'll take care of it tonight. And last night, that light was on in the living room most of the night. <laughs> I could hear the dog yelping, running around, banging the door, and Paula going, no, no, no. So she's at 10%. <laughs> but then you go, and you spend some time with the Lord, and you're up to about 90% on fire. This is the same day. And then later on, you go to work, and you have all these piles and hassles, and you're about at 50%. But then you meet your boss, and he gives you a raise, and you're up to 80% on fire for God now. But then what happens after that? Well, you go home, and you watch some show, and you're down to about 10%. But then you go to a small group. It was phenomenal, and you're up to 90%. But then you get back home, and you pay the bills, and, and you find out that your spouse didn't put the right amount of checks in, and you're about down to 40%. At the end of the day, when you put it all together, you've been about 65% on fire for Jesus. Why? Because spiritual growth is erratic. It's up and down in your life. Here's what I want you to understand. When it's up, enjoy it. When it's down, realize it's going to be up again eventually. I have found that God teaches me a whole lot more in the downs than he does the ups. Ups are fantastic, but it's not always up all the time. It's spiritual growth it is, is erratic. What's the second thing about spiritual growth that I hope is encouraging is this. Spiritual growth comes from what I call little commitments. Spiritual growth isn't a, a black and white thing. No, it's tiny little commitments that add up to big commitments, that add up to big growth. How many of y'all ever went to a church camp when you were a teenager? Some of you teenagers have gone to a, a camp. How many of y'all went to a, a camp when you were growing up? Okay. I did two, only once. Um, because then we moved overseas. And um, we didn't have them over there. I think I was 13 years old. And I can remember being so fired up on Saturday night because it was an emotional service. Man... I'm going to live for Christ. I'm going to be a missionary. I'm going to go home and I'm going to love my little sister. 
I mean, those things that I never thought I'd ever do. I was on fire for the Lord. I was geared up and ready to go. But you know what? Five days later, I kind of forgot about some of it. Like loving my little sister. Why is that? Because those things happen. But you know what? There were little commitments at that point in my life that helped make the bigger commitments later on. So understand the fact, maybe you're not making gigantic commitments every day. But if you're making little commitments, it becomes into a big commitment that can change your life. Sometimes these little commitments are just one degree. But you know what? They make the difference. So here's what I encourage you this morning. Do something with this message. In the next 72 hours, the next three days, spend a little time and put a plan together. Say, God, what do you have for me for the rest of this year? And here's what I want you to do. If you'll do that, if you'll say, Pastor Rick, I'm going to do something with this, I want you to send me a text, send me an email, and just put on it, growth plan in your name. If you'll send me a text with a growth plan in your name, I will put you on my prayer list, and I'll begin praying for you every day. That God will do something profound in your life. That 2021 will be a year where God changes you in a miraculous way. It might be that God wants you to read the Bible in a year, through in a year. We have a, You can go to my church app. You can go down the middle, bottom area. There's reading plans down there. You can click on certain areas, and it'll give you a guide on how to do that. It might be that you want to spend more time in prayer talking to him. You're going to make a commitment of 10 minutes a day or 5 minutes a day and start right there. God will bless you. I want you to make a commitment to understand what God has. Here's what I want you to understand. I love this church. I love being here. And I want to grow old with you. But I also want to continue to grow up with you. And I want you to have the same thing. I don't believe that when you become a pastor, you're all grown up and it's over with. I believe that in my life, God wants me to grow up more. And he wants me to do it with you. And we can be what God wants us to be. Amen. Could you bow your heads just for a moment with me this morning? And if you could say, Pastor, you know what? I, I want to grow up in my life. I want to try to apply the four principles, and I want to be there. I want you just to raise your hand this morning because I want to begin to pray right now for you. Yes, 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 yes. So many of you have raised your hands. You want to grow in the Lord. You don't just want to grow up. You don't just want to get old. You want God to cover you with his presence. Could you stand with me this morning? If you're with a family member, join hands with them. I'm not going to ask you to join hands with somebody who doesn't live with you. But I want to pray for you today. I'll be so glad when this whole COVID-19 thing is over with. We can all huddle up and share our flu with each other. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. I'm so thankful, dear Lord, that you don't knock us out of the race when we fail. We can't earn your love. We can only receive it. I'm so thankful, dear Lord, that there's not a three-strike rule that applies to your faith. But you simply love us. I thank you, dear Lord, that it's not based on performance. It's not even based on our disciplines or our habits. They'll simply draw us near to you. You love us, dear Lord, because we're your children. And Lord, we don't want to be different people when we leave here. We want to be your people. We want to be the person that you have shaped us to be because we're walking in the plan that you have for us. So dear Lord, together we say that we want to grow. We thank you for your love for us that's unconditional, that we can rest in your grace. And I pray, dear Lord, for all the people here this morning that are making decisions to change that you'll give us the strength, you'll give us the courage to, to admit our hurdles, to confess them to you. 
And I say right now, dear Lord, even as we ask for your forgiveness, I thank you for your forgiveness. We could spend all day just thanking you for what you've done in our lives. Lord, thank you for the challenge to never give up and stand firm for you. Dear Lord, I pray this morning across this sanctuary, especially for those who've raised their hands. Dear Lord, may it be more than just a, a mind commitment, may it be a heart commitment. That, dear God, we are going to be what you want us to be. We're going to take the time, dear God, set aside for you because you are the most important thing in our lives. Nothing compares to you. You sit upon the throne of our hearts. And if anything has displaced that this morning, we ask that it be stepped aside, that you sit upon that throne that belongs to you. Dear Lord, may you move in our lives. May you guide us through this week. Dear Lord, may you prepare divine appointments for us to walk into, that we will speak the words you want us to speak, that your Holy Spirit, dear God, will touch lives, and that we might have the privilege, dear God, to bring people into your kingdom because we're simply speaking out the words you've already planted in our lives. Dear Lord, may you move through us. May you speak through us, and may you speak to us. And we'll give you all the glory and the praise. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said.